and hello everybody and you're all very welcome back to the Tom and Jerry show where this week we are going to be uh, delving into episode two of our deep I'm not even going to say a deep dive Tom it doesn't suit the subject matter our doesn't. high dive yeah it doesn't it doesn't our but high at the same time we couldn't have justified it in one episode so we spread spread this over two it was only right to do the, the man himself Fred did the justice to do it over two because Exactly. You do you do you do deep dives on Jack Cousteau, you do high dives on Fred Dibna. Exactly. And we had basically we gave you the proper background. And we're probably only scratching the surface on a man that is as deep as the chimney cavities that he climbed. But we only scratched the surface because that's all we can do with the man. We didn't know him personally or whatnot. So we all we can do is tell you and put in the groundwork, build the foundations of oh. what there is to know about Fred Dibna. Because in part have, two, uh, Jer, we're uh, part, we're, yeah, we're, we're rocking and rolling here, and and and, and big thanks to everybody that uh, chimed in on the posts that we put up from Fred. If this was your first, in, some people it was their first introduction, and they're like, "Oh my God, who is this legend?" And others were like, "Yes, Fred, excellent, wonderful, love a bit of a bag. Haven't thought about the man in years." And hey, you know what? We're we're, we're delighted to have reignited that spark in you. I, I get very excited when Fred Divna comes up in conversation. As you can tell, and, both myself and Jerry can talk about him for hours. And not for nothing, Tom, we talked a lot last week and we did knock a single brick. So not let's one. rectify that. Let's not rectify one. That. <laughs> just like that, and I said at the top of the show at the previous episode, the, the, the very first, when I said, where did I know him from? That was the very first one I saw. It was not him climbing. It was him actually knocking down a chimney. Knocking yes. down a chimney in Bolton and... You know, he's given it as relaxed as you would sweet suffering Jesus. The relaxedness of the man doing it. If, if, I'm, I'm, I'm not this relaxed when I'm falling asleep. But you know what, Tom? I'll tell you what. Let's give it to them. What do you think? Yeah, let's kick it off. Let's kick it off. Okay, when last we left our uh, Bolton native Fred Dibner, uh, he had piqued the interest of local media and the BBC had come a knock and wanting to cover him for a documentary called Fred Dibner Steeplejack. Mm. Fred Stibna Steeplejack was an hour long BBC documentary that aired in 1979 Tom to instant critical acclaim and yeah. almost universal public adoration he was for want of a better phrase the fucking Iron Man of 1979 people were just like where's this guy been we love him we want him we want more the premise yeah. of the documentary was very simple a film crew followed Fred around as he went about his day to day work which you know what, if you've skipped episode one, Tom, probably sounds a wee bit mundane. But if you have indeed skipped episode one, go back and listen to it now. Makes sense. If you haven't, you'll know that Fred's work takes place 300 feet in the sky, where one wrong step would mean that you would get... <laughs> I have to out with the undertake, you know, like... <laughs> <laughs> never tire of that. I will never tire of that. <laughs> So for the documentary, we the BBC sent shaky-legged camera crews rolling 16 millimeter film up to the top of the chimneys with Fred, so they could see him knocking down chimneys with a bolster and a hammer, but also opening up a view of the city around them, which is commonplace on every day to Fred because that's where he worked every day. But unlike Fred, most people had never seen a city that looked like this. For the first time, the public got the same bird's eye view from the top of the chimney that Fred did, which would be an entertaining enough show for sure. But what made it an instant classic was Fred himself. Yeah, and that that's what it was for me, because no doubt at the time there would have been construction shows that would have been, you know, there would have been it would have been overly produced, heavily produced stuff that you're seeing typically popping up in the television, which I saw in the 90s, you know, even though that this was done, you know, back in, you know, 70s, early 80s, that kind of thing. You wouldn't have, it wouldn't have caught you the way, even doing what he was doing. Because you're like, oh, well, that's just a camera crew because you never put yourself really in their, in their shoes. You never do. It's like, oh, great. I've seen what the top of sky, skyscrapers looked like, you know, in the 90s, albeit the late 90s, I was up, you know, I was up the Chrysler building. I was up the Eiffel yes. Tower. You know, I was up these. It wasn't that mad. But when you see Fred, is who's the man. When you see Fred, the 1979 audience 
couldn't believe what they were seeing. Finally, it was like, oh, that's what it looks like from up there. It's 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 incredible. And and again, you could stick a camera up and do a time lapse of a day uh, in Bolton, and I'm sure it would be wonderful photography. But I don't see anybody caring about it. But when you stick Fred in the middle of that, just this little Beano character at the top of the <laughs> chimney with a hammer and chisel pounding away at something, fag out the corner of his mouth. It was crazy. I mean, like, you know, I do believe that it appealed to the working class audiences who could uh, see someone that represented themselves on screen. Yeah, like their yeah, best. yeah, yeah. This is this is the working class. Uh, uh, the best example of us. This is this is one of us. He's a, he's the standard bearer for who we are and what we do. And then, indeed, you have your middle to upper class audiences who just loved Fred. He had a genuine love of history he had a knowledge of a subject. And not for nothing, Tom. He was a gas bastard. I mean, like, you know, did we happen to mention what happens if you fall off a chimney? Oh, yeah. Half day out with the undertaker, you know. Like, yeah. <laughs> but it does. But you know, do you know when you meet some, you know when you know somebody, maybe they might not be your best friend or even a good friend, but you know when you know somebody that on the job somewhere, whether you're a delivery driver for fucking Guinnesses or, you know, a maintenance guy that goes to factories and there's somebody there that you know you're looking forward to seeing them you know that kind of even like i i remember i there was there was a route i used to take when i was doing the insurance fucking assessment it was a route i used to take just to walk down this one town i there was a bunch of houses in this direction and all that but there was a dog i fucking love this dog this dog had he was like a golden retriever and i'd spend 20 minutes fucking nearly talking to the dog he used to make me so happy but the dog had no airs and graces he was just a fucking dog and he was just doing dog, dog being things. a dog and that's what Fred was. Fred had the unbelievable magnetism to take a relative, let's call it, we, we didn't know the intricacies. In fairness, I'm learning from it here, the intricacies of what he actually did. That wasn't necessary. All you needed was Fred, who didn't give a fuck if there was a camera there or not. It was exactly, he was exactly the guy that he would have been if he were down pub, you know, at a funeral, possibly at a game. You know, or working on job, you know, he was the same bloke that you meet all the time. He and he never, you wouldn't have to fucking open your mouth around him. You just fucking press play and off he goes. I fucking and love him. Imagine it's... if Fred was around now and had a podcast. That would be top of my Spotify list if Fred Dibna <laughs> had a fucking pod, podcast just to listen. And I know there are people because they've been in contact. There's people from the north of England, and we had a couple of North North of England listeners before at the very and I'm so excited on their behalf but I guarantee you they'll probably listen to my version of his accent going oh Jesus Christ oh, but yeah. <laughs> I think it's quite good Tom to be honest with you yeah but you know at the same time Americans think far and away was a decent you well, know, this like is representation of Ireland like, but I'm, I'm you know I'm aware of it but I'm saying can you imagine if he had a Spotify you know he'd be Joe Rogan right now I mean, it's it, 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 it really is incredible. And like, you know, I, I've said it a couple of times that it really does seem like a Beano character come to life. But like for the audience that was there, he really did just seem like this uh, larger than life uh, character with, with just like just like the, the perfect thing to stick a camera on and, yeah. and roll. Nobody would have done it, though. Nobody would have done it. I don't think. It was the perfect, you know, when like well, not a perfect storm, but you know, when something absolutely out of the blue happens. One person's br- I was piqued by the notion of him and went, will we, we just bang a camera on him? Because, will, we, will we roll the dice on this little Bolton guy? You know, what was the run into it? Were they talking to the vicar? Did they talk to, did he do somebody's, you know, did he fix the shingles on somebody's fucking somebody's building somewhere up the town that was actually related to maybe a producer or something like that? You know, or was honestly, it just I I, we have I, I fucking nothing? We got nothing th- this week, guys. Look at that guy. Think, Let's go talk to I him. I think we're we're about to get in to what cemented Fred Dibner's uh, four quadrant appeal, as marketing wankers say. Oh god, <laughs> which would be the most unfred scenario. The to most you. unfred thing. But this is this is what uh, this is this is we're about to get into it. Okay, this is this is what this is the uh, cherry on the top top mm. because. With the best will in the world, the daily comings and goings of a steeplejack will only carry an audience's interest for so long. There's only so far beautiful scenery will get you. And Fred, as much as he can talk about, you know, pointing brickwork, whether it's 300 feet or not, up to, up or not, it's not great TV. Mm. But what really caught the public's attention was not just the terrifying footage of Fred clambering over an overhanging scaffold hundreds of feet up, a 
bless myself every time I see it, Tom. But the footage of the other aspect of Fred's job, <laughs> one that really made him a household name and the one that we haven't really mentioned thus far, knocking shit down. Yeah, yeah. Because let's be fucking honest. Hells yes. Let's be honest. Nice and all as, you know, to pay homage to these beautiful pieces of architectural engineering geniuses by, you know, tending to them and repointing them and fixing them. Fuck me if you got to drop one of them, Jerry. You know, everybody, there, there's very few people shared Fred's love of the chimneys and love of their history, but pretty much everybody loved the spectacle yeah. of one of these guys coming down. We've all watched now, Fred Dibna, We've watched and 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 truth be known, Fred Dibna, if he'd had his way, would have preserved and renovated every chimney in Bolton for all time. And hey, who knows? Build another few. Keep them coming. But the fact is that many of these structures, Tom, were old. Yeah. Over a hundred years old in many instances. A hundred year old brick chimneys built in the late eighteen hundreds. You know? Phenomenal. Case, Tom, phenomenal piece of engineering when you think about it. To get that all the way up there and it's still standing on the foundations with no buildings really to keep it tethered or anything like that. It's still up there. North of England winds. Oh. I mean, if you look at some of the Fred of the of Fred of the later Fred uh, documentaries, he's repairing chimneys where he doesn't have to drill holes to hammer in the dogs because there's already holes drilled there and just refilled with a little bit of mortar. Uh, and as he says himself, these are guys that are climbing these chimneys in the early 1900s. So they don't even have Fred's shit ladders. They've got Terry. They've got horse <laughs> ladders. They've got rope made out of horse hair, Tom. Okay. You know they believed in fucking witches back then. So. You know, so, so this is this is Fred's Fred's, albeit most likely ridiculously, you know, health and safety conscious in comparison to these mad bastards. Besides these mad bastards, because like as we said, in the best will of the world, these chimneys are beautiful, but a lot of them were either beyond repair or just very simply obsolete. Yeah, not needed, Tom. They needed to come down to make way for who knows if it's Dublin, they need to make a hotel. But yeah. one way or another, this son of a bitch needs to come down. And so it fell to people like Fred to bring them down to ground level one way or another. This is a well-paid, usually dangerous, and frequently spectacular occurrence that really put Fred Dibna on the road to start. Now, Tom, let's knock a chimney down. Three oh, ways to do it. There's three ways. If there's a fourth way, I've yet to find it. There's three ways to take a chimney from standing to not standing. And number one was dynamite. A big no no for Fred. No, he's the dynamite men. Fucking dynamite. dynamite men. Like you could hear it in his voice anytime he said it. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. There was no authenticity. You know, there'd be no you're just you're just using dynamite. It's dynamite is doing all the work. Dust everywhere. Bloody bricks blown to hell, you know. He 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 really did like you know, well, you know. Yeah, you can do the accent, Tom, better than I can, that much is for sure. But he really does throw a little bit of salt. It's the only time you I ever like hear a little bit of disdain in Fred's voice. He's nice to everybody about everything, but he goes, ah, oh, you know, the dynamite men, what they're going to do. And the dynamite men are the same dynamite men that are blowing shit up to this day, Tom. If you need a tower block brought down, you bring in the dynamite. They wire it up with explosives. Everybody stands back. You push a plunger down, which was something that really seems to have vexed Fred. He really hated the notion of pushing a plunger down in one go and a chimney falling down. Just, he just, I, I, I can't fathom what it was, or maybe we'll, it's, maybe we'll work it out together, but it just seemed to be, uh, what, as best as I can understand, too fucking easy for Fred. How I, I may, compared it in my head was that if Fred was the, you know, the ultra respectful hunter, if he was the ultra respectful yes. hunter, basically he used every part of the animal, honored the animal, you know, took took what he needed purely for sustenance, i.e. he took these chimneys down with respect. Possibly the bricks were able to be used afterwards because he didn't blow it to shit. You never know. You know, chances are they were. They probably went and repaired a lot of, you know, heritage places around the city because it would have been old bricks. And I never even thought about that. You're absolutely oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those bricks weren't going to hell. No, no, they weren't. They weren't going to be crushed. They're really well-made bricks. People would pay big money, probably two pounds I a never brick. even thought about that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but your dynamite, man, trophy hunters that pay the quarter of a million rich fucking dentists or plastic surgeons to go out to Africa and just shoot a fucking lion or an elephant in the head 
just so they can say they can do it and justify it in their own, you know, justify it in their own way that, okay, well, what we're paying is, you know, funding the communities to actually keep these animals safe from poachers. You know, this is how we justify it. And it is a weird, weird world where Fred is like, no, no, I only hunt in season. I only hunt the right animals, healthy animals, just to keep, you know, absolutely 100% He's a sustainability he's a, he's a, when it comes to it. He's a bit of a yeah. He's a nose to tail steeplejack. Exactly, and he's honouring the building by taking him down correctly. Would you know, like he just he just laying him down like a baby. Uh, the 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 dynamite men is one thing, okay, because uh, he, Fred didn't like blowing up chimneys. That's number one, and 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 it's a big bugbear in the Fred Dibner community on Facebook that I can see in any one of the uh, any number of the Fred Dibner appreciation pages I've seen they don't like him referred to as the guy who blew up the chimneys they don't like no that. no no don't like that he never blew up a chimney in his life but what he did do Tom in particular instances is the second way you can get a chimney to the ground you see sometimes you just can't blow shit up you just can't knock shit down because the surrounding areas don't allow for the filling of the chimney okay mm. you might want to get a chimney to the ground but there's a factory there and a housing estate there so there's no way that you can demolish it so to speak so what do you do Tom you take it apart brick by brick and we are not fucking dancing around this Tom that's not like oh yeah brick by brick no you actually you touch knock every it down. fucking brick, every brick, every single brick. Yeah. What Fred would do is he would ladder and scaffold the chimney as usual that we detailed in episode one. Mm-hmm. Go up with a hammer and chisel and knock that sucker apart, brick by damn brick. He would drop the bricks down the center of the chimney and follow them course by course over weeks and even months. Literally, as you would build a chimney in reverse, he knocked every single brick. In some instances, the bricks couldn't be dropped down the chimney. And I'll be honest with you, Tom, I watched a couple of these and Fred explained it. I could never quite uh, understand why you couldn't just throw the bricks down the center of the chimney. But on occasion, you couldn't. And in those instances, the bricks would be lowered down in a pulley contraption of Fred's own design. Okay, I guarantee you this thing has at least a couple of pram wheels in it. Yeah. What you would get is you would have two buckets, one that was at the top of the chimney with a pulley, and the other that was down the bottom on a sort of a zip line kind of thing. Uh-huh. You would fill the bucket at the top. You would release the lever and it would zip down. And as it did so, it would pull up an empty bucket zip to the top. Yeah. Fred at the top would fill that bucket. And down at the bottom, it would be emptied by Fred's trusty laborer and friend, Donald Payton. Donald, you know what? Boy. Let's have a crack about Donald. Because he features in pretty much everything that uh, a, a lot of the early work of uh, Fred's, uh, of the Fred documentaries that I have watched, he's Fred Laborers. He's his guy on the ground, Tom. He's his, uh, he's he's his, his wingman. Man, so he's me, man. He's your man. You know, he, he, he's me left hand. He, me, me, me right hand, me bloody left hand too sometimes, you know. He's a bloody good man. He, it's, it's hard to find a good man, you know. I, 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 when he described, did you ever hear him give him the description of that? You know, some blokes, you know, young'uns. Young'uns like, they, yeah. they, you know, chasing girls and down the pub and <laughs> turning up with bloody hangovers, you know. You know and, Donald is a, and Donald, the most kowtowing, quiet didn't want like if this was modern it would be cutaways all the time to fucking donald gone you know it's just awesome working with fred you know i'm learning a lot right now and you know hopefully it's we can get after it and get it done you know nah. donald would they would they would they would poochie donald yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> but no he's just a guy who if anything is even more unassuming whose flat cap seems even flatter than fred's yeah and he's just as quiet solemn presence at the bottom of the chimney uh, sending buckets up to Fred, uh, tying ladders onto the ropes that he drops down, sending up planks, and helping Fred out. Donald, I gotta tell you, well, you you've passed away now, but uh, thank you for your service. He was, I loved, and I loved the way he talked about him, like he was a good lad. And Donald was like well up in the years, like you know. But yeah, we're talking about like he's like he's he's Robin to Fred's Batman. No, he's like a, he's an old, he's an old, yeah, he's guy. An old guy, like yeah. Uh, but uh, he gets it done, and, 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 and he knows it. He literally was. He was. You could tell on those days, you know, where he was. There was no. They weren't radioing up and down to each other like they, you know. He. They were just. They were in sync. They were fucking in sync, man. You can't buy that. And I think that's what Fred was trying to say about Donald. Is that you can't train that. Like he's. 
you he's can't train it. it. No, he's got that. He's I, got it. Man. I will say, I listened to an interview with with uh, with Fred where he, he he states proudly that he's never killed anybody. But <laughs> I mean, he says it in such. <laughs> But he says it in his own way, oh, you know, I've never killed anybody. Real matter of fact, I've never killed anybody, which which says to me, number one, people do die at this. Uh, steeplejacks injure or kill people on the ground by either dropping bricks on them or, or what have you. So that he hasn't killed anybody uh, speaks not just to the a testament to Fred's work, but also to Donald, that Donald will be down on the bottom holding court, knowing when to stand back when there's a fucking brick coming down. You know a brick or two has lost lost his way out of the bucket. Friday evening, and you're trying to get the last few buckets down, you're like, oh, for the love of fuck, Error, I'll throw in another one, and it goes flying. Donald would know to stay the fuck out of the way of that, and also, I can only imagine, Tom, that when there's work like this going on, that there's pups of young lads about the place. Of course there so is. So when Fred's up here in the skies, chiseling away at a, at, a, at, a, at a chimney, like, Donald was probably downstairs, down at the bottom of the ladder, fielding scuts of kids, get the fuck away from me. Ah, young'uns, like, you know, you know. There's going to be blocks coming down. Fucking young'uns. Ah. Oh, boy. So that's two methods that you can take a chimney down. You can knock it down brick by brick, or you can get the fucking dynamite men in to do it, Tom. But the third method of knocking a chimney is the my, one... My personal favourite, by the way. Personal favourite. Fred Dibna Steeplejack made Fred Dibna Steeplejack must watch TV. Fred Dibna's method of choice and a favorite of the Steeplejacks back in the 1800s, which is probably why Fred had a penchant for it himself. Damn it was right. a method known as the fire pit. Do you know what? It's so retro, isn't it? I fucking love how retro he's been here. Like he's just, it's, it's, you know, sometimes you like nowadays. It's a bit of a hipster vibe, is what he's doing here, going back to always. You know, but he I is going love old it. school with it. This is this is artisan chimney knocking. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it is. It's fucking artisan chimney fucking filling, isn't it? Yeah, Tom. Yeah, give it to the people. Let's 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 hear. Let's let's hear. What do you got? What's the what is the fire pit, Tom? So, you know, it's uh, it's basically what it sounds like, of course, is this fire, you know, in a pit, but it's, it's at, at the bottom of the chimney. So uh, it's a foolproof method of filling a chimney, which is featured, you know, in Steeplejack, uh, you know, as I down the chimney in Rochdale, as the cameras roll like it was, you know, it was it was the one that really. You know, shall we say, for the want of a better word, sparked people's interest in me, you know. <laughs> yeah. Personally, I, co- I couldn't see it, but it seemed funny, you know, it seemed, seemed interesting. You know, this, of course, gave the world the iconic scene, you know, where I was blanketed in billowing smoke, normal Tuesday, scarpering clear of a structure, you know, and it began to shower bricks down around me, you know, mercifully missing me, you know, <laughs> like, oh, what are these bloody, I don't know, so Super Mario or Sonic Hedgehog, you know, <laughs> out of the way. <laughs> so I ran. I mean, it was, like I said, normal Tuesday for me and Donald, but, you know, as the dust from the demolition shrouded, you know, the beautiful landscape that is Bolton, yeah, you know, pop me head out. You know, somebody reckoned I look like one of the Bash Street kids or something. <laughs> I don't even know what that is, but, you know, I just asked him, as I normally do, you know, when something dramatic or funny happens, you know, the, the immortal line, you know, did you like that? Of <laughs> course, turns out, <laughs> they fucking did. <laughs> they absolutely did. They absolutely did. That is a, a, a description of the scene in Fred Dibner Steeplejack. As the Rochdale chimney came, it's the down, opener. Fred, it's the opener on every show. It became episode. the opener of every show since of 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 Fred just giving that line. I'll not do the accent. He gives the line. <laughs> you know, did you like that? And he literally, he literally, like shit. They would green screen the balls out of now. He walks away and gives a little bit of a sidestep and scuttle, which would have been fucking pointless. Had he actually been in danger, 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 like because the sky, like the little sidestep, and he gives this hooter, this handheld, her, her, this, this, this I mean, asthmatic let's, let's, hooter in his fucking hand, Jerry. That let's 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 dive into it. Let's dive into this fucking. Fire yeah, pit. I mean, like, <laughs> if you want to know what it is that caused such a scene of chaos, that that was the money shot in Fred Dibner Steeplejack, the documentary, a fire pit, Tom, yeah. is basically where the steeplejack will knock holes in the base of the chimney. Strategically he put will... to lining it up. Strategically, the direction, yes. It, the direction he wants it to come down in. 
Exactly. So it's like fell in a tree. If you want a tree to fall left to right, then you chop away one side of it until it's weak and the other side snaps and the thing comes down. Mm -hmm. So that is what you do with a, a chimney in the fire pit method. So Fred and indeed Donald would go to the side of the chimney that they thought would bring it down where we wanted it to be. And again, Tom, I don't know about you. I've watched a lot of these, but I never seen the man with like a little at one of those little sextets in his hand. One of those. With, 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 he does uh, not have a plumb bob, Jer. He does not. Own he doesn't a have a plumb bob. Can, he doesn't I have what do you call you, the wheel? The he measuring have, wheel on a. He, nor does he have it the odd light mapping out exactly where it's going to be using fucking algorithms, actual algorithms, people. I know everybody uses the word algorithm now, but I can tell you here now it's to do with actual physics. No, he ain't. No. He ain't. If at best, I would imagine he's using a thumb and maybe pacing it out roughly like, you know, to make yes. sure he don't take Gable end off, you know, Norma Butheridge's house up there because, you know, she'd be, she'd be pretty miffed, so she would. Um, as, no, as this, a, but no, my my Jesus, a, he landed it on the money every time. He landed them every single time. It, it, it's it, it's insane. I mean, it gets to the point where you're 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 looking at it and going, you know, this is either brilliance or luck, yeah. and it's a very fine line. But Fred Dibna, as he said himself, never killed anybody and uh, seemed to land every single one of the ninety chimneys he felled exactly where he wanted to be. With this fire pit method, which was, as we've said before, absolute fucking lunacy. You would find the side of the chimney that is most likely to uh, get the uh, get the beast down to where you want it to be. You would knock away the bricks. Tom, you would play actual fucking Jenga with a 300 yeah. foot tower. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is this is almost it's the it's almost the same method as if you were getting a bigger opening put. A lot of people open their sitting rooms up to the hall to give a yes. big or you know into yes. the extension or into the kitchen where maybe it was only a double doors or a single door. They wanted to create a big opening. And what you would do is you would drill above the doorway with maybe a two inch dry pipes through it and use acro props to take the strain off the upstairs so that you could then yes yes create cut out a shape for to the size you would want and then slip in a lintel take out said prop and drop them down so it's similar to that in that he would knock out these holes and jenga as jerry said jenga as quick as fuck he would get in chopped up telegraph poles so he'd cut it out to maybe a three foot hole and just a, yes. chop, a, a three foot piece of a telegraph pole disused which to me is the variable that would bother me jerry because not every telegraph pole is as sound especially when they're second hand ones are as yes. sound you know what i mean they didn't all this is the variable that any engineering company would absolutely lose their biscuits over because they're going you're yes. just using random chopped up telegraph poles that one might have a rot in yes. the middle of it somewhere and he's slapped it in to where the bricks once were until he gets a, a jail cell looking toothy grin on the side of it with nothing but maybe 20 of these chop, three foot telegraph poles propping up it's the absolutely fucking, fucking insane insane <laughs> I, 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 like in 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 later series, he it shows him um making wedges of timber at home with his bandsaw yeah. that he puts the Which, fucking even that. Jer, I'm looking at me on the ta- on the table saw, and it's just his thumb right beside the blade. I'm like, oh fuck, get a piece of yeah. get a piece of two by one or something. Bread. But then and I'm he's going, doing all this he's by fifty odd. Eye. He's fifty odd, and he hasn't lost a I'm lost a thumb yet. You know, I haven't killed somebody, yet. and you're like, okay. Haven't haven't killed anybody. Got both my thumbs. All right, fair enough. <laughs> so he makes this. He makes. He basically takes away all the bricks from one side of the chimney, and as Tom says, puts the uh, telegraph poles in and puts the wedges in to knock it together. So now that the chimney is literally resting on telegraph on chopped up telegraph poles and timbers. Okay. Now, when they are removed, the chimney will fall. That's just science. Okay. If those timbers are holding up the uh, the chimney. And you take those timbers away. If you take the prop that does sustain my house, Tom, that fucker's coming down. Yeah. But, and there's a clue in the name fire pit. What's the best way to get that timber out of there, Tom? Oh, well, you can talk to it nicely if you want, but it's timber. And it's timber that's been treated with bitumen from down through the years because that's what telegraph Mm. poles were coated with. So why not start a fucking fire in behind it? Why not? It's a chimney. Give it one last hurrah. You know what I mean? Give it it one one last last hurrah. Give it one last puff of the fag. 
Fred and his cohorts, uh, because this uh, this is where Fred would get a little bit of extra help in, uh, and and it's generally from factory workers of whatever factory that he's bringing down. Well, you know, a little team would uh, throw tires. Hey, sorry, it was, you know, not as environmentally conscious back then. Throw, throw tires, timbers, rubbish, pretty much anything into this little jail cell of timber at the bottom of this three up to three hundred foot chimney, and Tom. What a match. Yeah. The nerves of the man, even at that stage. Can you imagine? We've all gone away and left the job, you know, half done to be finished the next day. And you're going, fucking hell, would that be all right now? Am I doing it? Yeah. Jeez. Can you imagine, say you're dropping on Friday and on Thursday you've gone, right. Now, that's almost all. You know, we've only two more to put in in morning. So we go, it's finishing time, Donald. Let's head home. How do you go home? No one you you've left it like that and sleep like that. Like one of the ones he was dropping, the, a local chap was up around chatting to him. Do you remember this? And he says, uh, ah, there was a bloody youngsters up around here. You know, they were messing. Yeah. Yeah, well, the young ones. The young ones. Oh, and, and he's just, he's nodding nonchalantly like the same way as he said, the fucking thing was full of horse flies here this evening. There was midges everywhere. They were eating us. He went, oh, yeah, well, you know, kids will be kids. You're like, no, fucking no. No. Kids to be level with the ground. So we light the fire pit and it would uh, burn. Basically what you're doing here, Tom, is you're lighting the fuse of a, of a firecracker. You're lighting the fuse of a black cat banger, mm-hmm. uh, which always gives me the heebie-jeebies and I do an arm's length. But this is, we're talking about a 300, up to 300 foot red brick chimney. They would light the fire. It would get roaring. As you say yourself there, Fred, the chimney would get one last burst of smoke through it. And Fred would approach the chimney from the rear <laughs> and monitor monitor the mortar on the back of the chimney the mortar and joints, when yeah. he started to see cracks appear in the mortar joints that's when he knew that the chimney was starting to lean forward this is the science of it tom he was standing beside a chimney that was about to fall not looking at it through a telescope not monitoring it through cctv no. he was feeling the hot bricks yeah as they started to crack and crumble in front of him and then when he felt that it was ready to go he would hold up as you described it this fucking asthmatic little air horn oh. where he pumped it like a bicycle <laughs> like a like a bicycle pump, and, we're like, <laughs> and to no point because nobody's getting out from under that to pay like he ain't given a, a 10 second warning it's already on on way when he's yes. given the hoot. It's Fred. Fred, man. Get rid of that joke because that's only... that's It's it's useless. I mean, it, it amazes me his disdain for the dynamite men that could tell you five, four, three, two, one, press the plunger and it's gone. He hated that. He was much more in favor of kind of knowing sort of where the chimney was going to fall and kind of sort of knowing roughly speaking whether it was going to fall in the next five minutes or not. But as he said himself, once you lit that fire pit, it was coming down. It's a simple matter of physics. And at the end of Fred Dibnis' steeplejack, we do have that wonderful scene of Fred where the chimney goes. And, you know, he says he's never dropped a chimney where it wasn't supposed to be. But he sure looked mighty fucking surprised that it was coming his way. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, he fucking did. Yeah, he was like a fucking he was like a springbok on the fucking Serengeti. You know, when there's all of a sudden a line comes out of nowhere, it's like fucking two sidesteps and he's gone. You're like, oh, he's gone. Yeah, he's, he's gone. gone. And, 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 and made it to the end. And of course, the line that, that, that as we've said, that showed up in every Fred Dibner uh, documentary since, did you like that? <laughs> did the you cheeky like that? look on his face just cemented him as an icon. Because the answer from the audience to Fred's question, did you like that, was a resounding yes. Absolutely. Critics and audiences fell in love with the death-defying acts of Dibna, leading to a 1979 Best Documentary BAFTA win for Fred Dibna's steeplejack and a hunger for more of the same, please. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what he was? Just dawned on me, Jer. Do you know why he hated Dynamite Men? He hated the whole strategic counting it down and everything else. The he strategy was a, of it? Yeah, that it was, it was, no, it was too, it was too homogenized for him. Man's a fucking artist. He's painting, he's painting with that fucking chimney as he drops it. That's a fucking artist, man. He's an artist, Jer. You can't fucking, you can't tell an artist to fucking don't feel your way through the moment. You know what I mean? Here's the exact way you're going to do it. That's a, that's a fucking 
that's a warp fucking soldier. That's a fucking drone. No, Fred was a fucking artist, man. That's what he was. I mean, I, I'm not going to argue that point. He, he absolutely was. And, and, and uh, Tom, like if this was today, I got to tell you, after Fred Dibna steeplejack, the BB said, let's have more Fred Dibna. I, I can't help but think that today, if there was one good steeplejack and show, oh. then uh, you'd be you'd be six months away from extreme steeplejacking. He'd fucking ruin it. They'd You'd ruin, ruin it. it. I mean, once Pawn Stars hit big, then you had Hardcore Pawn. You had Hardcore Pawn Detroit and all this kind of shit. Jesus You'd have spin off shows. You'd have Ice Road Trucking fucking Steeplejacks, Jer. It would be fucking yes. ruined. It deadliest was... Catch. How many spin offs are Deadliest Catch is there? Deadliest. Oh, yeah, I mean, Deadliest fucking Steeplejack. Yeah, Jesus Christ, you're right. They would absolutely. It would turn Fred Prostituted. They would prostituted into the ground Nat Geo and fucking Discovery and before you know it Fred would be restoring a fucking car somewhere and trying to sell it to flip it for another fucking one or something yeah, he'd be selling he'd the be bricks flip- <laughs> or, or like you know it, it wouldn't even be Fred it'd be whatever fucking come day go day steeplejack that you could find he'd have neck tattoos you know it like he'd, and he'd have all a nick- this kind of shit he'd have a nickname like the growler or something like that yeah he'd fucking ruin it yeah, yeah. <laughs> fucking I-, <laughs> I don't have a bosun's chair. I got a bosun's throne. Yeah. Oh, and he would definitely, like, that guy would have a tattoo of it on his fucking yeah. arm or neck somewhere. And it'd be always, always rouse. They'd be rouse. Donald and himself would be constantly shouting at each other. You know, the real steeplejacks of London. Shit like this. I mean, yeah. they like, you know, French be damned. <laughs> but luckily, back in the day, there was some decorum and there was there was no fucking cable satellite TV. There was just BBC. Their audience, like Fred, the BBC fucking gladly gave them more Fred. Yeah. They commissioned a new eight-part series simply titled Fred, which gave us more chimney felling, more ladder scaling, more steam-powered crack, giving us more access to Fred's day-to-day life. And sure, why not? This time, he's bringing the wife and the family. Oh, yeah. So let's introduce ourselves to uh, to Fred's wife. She actually featured in the first Fred documentary, Fred Dibna Steeplejack, back in 1978. And at that stage, he'd been married to her for over 10 years. Her name was Alison Foster. He'd married her 10 years ago, having eloped in 1967 when Fred was 29 and Alison was 19 years old, with Fred claiming that he first set eyes on Alison from a chimney he was repairing. And he could actually tell which route she took to and from school every day, which... You know, to hear him tell the story, it's romantic a little bit, I guess. But also, it's a guy approaching a young woman and saying, "I well, see you took a left today. You normally go right as a conversation starter. Hey, look, you know, I mean, things that were creepy back then are creepy now. That was just romantic back then. I'm just saying you're 100% right. Also, reading it in text, it doesn't read well. Doesn't read well. Fred's accent, you know, tell them like, you know, well, I quite, I, I quite like, you know, I cooed to them back in the day, you know, what's <laughs> that? I even said to him, you know, I was watching from, well, I was re- repairing the, the chimney over there, you know, the old boot polish chimney. Uh, I used to watch it going to school. Uh, I said it to her, you know, I, I knew I used to see your route going to school, of course, you know, you'd stop off and, you know, you'd buy, you know, acid drops, you know, for, you know, Couple of sweeties or whatever. I thought to myself, yeah, she, she's a well, she's a young one, but she's nice, you know. You know, it's, it's fine. You know, didn't see any, any problem with it. Now you put that in an American guy's accent. So yeah, yeah. I, was, I was watching you. And you know, I'm watching you. You walking from school. You're like, oh Jesus Christ! End of all of a sudden. Go to open. Extreme steeple Fucking go to open. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta tell you, at no stage in the Tom and Jerry uh, show podcast will you hear either of us call Fred Dibna a liar. But uh, from three hundred feet up, could he? See That's the only girl? thing. I don't know. I mean, like you know, who's to say- take you May- at your word, Fred? Maybe they weren't all. You know, but it, again, he was an artist. We'll give him the poetic license here. It might have been. He might have just been. Look, not not every day was going to be a three hundred foot chimney. Some days he was going to get a two story flat roof chair. Yeah, Just okay. Some days, he's sweet. yeah, some days he's sweeping chimneys, which he also yeah. did at the time. Regardless of which, I got to tell you, Tom, elopement, by the way. I, I just kind of threw that in there that mm. they eloped. Uh, again, a dying art, I feel, these days. You don't hear too much, many elopements these days. You don't elopement be... for anybody, yeah. They don't uh, happen. For, I mean, younger audiences might not know what elopement is. Yeah. Uh, uh, elopement is basically a man and a woman just saying, fuck this, and fucking off and getting married. That's it. No ceremony. Uh, no pomp, no no circumstance. Just hey, you know what? Do you want to go get married? Yeah, okay. Jump in the car. Let's go. 
There's a, a real bit, Vegas kind of thing. There's a bit of it going on now. It's kind of trendy. Just us guys. We j- we just tied the knot. No big deal. Relax. Good look. We just we there's just a bit of it. I mean, like you know, I've 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 had two friends that have eloped. I've had two friends that eloped. Yeah, they, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They went to the court up to the courthouse. Got it sorted. Gone. Good looking. Thanks. Well, but, you know what? I, I mean, there's a lot to be said for it. I mean, as you say yourself there, Tom, there's a lot of people doing it for trendy reasons. Uh, back in the day, Fred and Alison eloped because they had an argument about how many people would be invited to the wedding. Hey. Until one party just said, hey, you know what? Fuck this. Let's just go do it. And I have a funny feeling I know which one it was. That started yeah. that conversation. Well, to be fair, let's be honest. It was, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of relatives got mentioned. You, I mean, you were at, we were at, we've been at each other's weddings. There was a lot of relatives... That didn't quite make it to my own. I'll be honest with you. <laughs> well, was... if you'd already uh, if you'd already watched Steeplejack, then you've already gotten a glimpse at, at Fred's wife, Alison. She was the lady who had the honor of lighting the fire pit that would demolish the chimney that nearly flattened her husband. I mean, this was her uh, this was her ceremony. She would uh, set it, he, Fred would set it up, and Alison would come on and light it. And I always thought it was funny, Tom, that she. When he say, when we say she lights it, she 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 offers a flame, uh, she offers a flaming stick to the to, to the to the uh, mound of rubbish at the bottom of the chimney until it barely catches fire, and then Fred's go like, "I'll take it for me, I love." <laughs> but you know, isn't it nice though? Isn't it nice to involve her? It is know. nice. Yeah, it's you can light one candle on the uh, on the birthday cake. <laughs> But at the same time, I think it's nice. She, it is you know, nice. Yeah, it's nice. It's She's nice. a part of it. She is, and there's part a big, you know, there's a big load of people watching. All, all people from the neighborhood, you know, because they gather around because there's fuck all else to be doing. And also, Fred Dibner's about to drop a chimney. This is some fucking Ric Flair level shit. Like, yeah, oh yeah. This is let's be honest. In like, lady. bringing in the lady. You know, she gets to fucking. She that like she. It's puts, pretty. Bo- I will I, say it's I pretty. Like ball. It. He didn't eat. I think that's balling. You know, I don't. It's pretty ball, and he didn't trust her to light the whole fire. But oh no, fuck no, Jesus Christ, she's not a <laughs> fuck like she's just Alison rocking in with her fucking fiery stick. Good on you, Al. Nice one. Cheers. Now step the fuck back, please. Thank you very much. Yeah, I got it from here, Alice. Yeah. So anyway, by the time the eight-part series called Fred appeared on screens, the couple had three daughters named Caroline, Lorna, and Jane, and they lived in the gatehouse of an estate on the outskirts of Bolton, with a large back garden where Fred could indulge in his other passion in life. Steam engine. Mm. Before we talk about a steam engine, Tom, I just gotta say, gatehouses. Fucking, I would love to live in a gatehouse. I've lived in two. What's not to like about a gatehouse? I've lived in two gatehouses. You have. I I have. You have. That's right. Yeah. I fucking love gatehouses. It's like you know, how do you not feel like you own that whole estate? Oh, I absolutely did, and that was the only reason why, you know, these ancient fucking buildings, like the last one, especially was was a gatehouse to. it was one of six gatehouses to Bushy Park, which was the big, you know, out in kind of Bray District at the time. Like they, it would literally, you did, because it was a miniature, it was almost like a folly. You know, it was a miniature version of the big house, the stylings and all of it yes. and everything. And it was fucking cool. You know, it was, and it was, it was very well presented because it was to be the like, first entry point of the big old gates and everything. And it was cool as shit. Cool. It was cool shit. as shit. I mean, like, you know what, Tom? Every single person that drove past that would have said to themselves, imagine if you lived in there. Yeah, and it did. And you we were looked... the one that got to say, I fucking do live there. Well, listen, it looked like fucking Hansel and Gretel's house. It was a, it was ridiculous. And every day you go, that's a fucking cool house. That's a cool house. Okay, it's a bit of a pain in the bollocks of a house. And had it been actually mine, I would have had to fucking dry line the thing. But I'm just saying, you know, it was... It, st- it, no, I'm, I'm a sucker for fucking history and a his- historical architecture and fucking nostalgia. Proper nostalgia. I don't mean like talking about the leaving cert in the 90s. I mean nostalgia from 1880s. When we were probably all, my my people were probably just picking potatoes for the British. But there's still yeah. something in me. I love Downton Abbey. I don't mind admitting it. Do you know, there's something in me where I go, maybe, maybe I could be Lord of the Manor one day. I mean, like, you know, it's 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 like you're channeling Fred Dibner, quite honestly, because that was exactly why he liked the gatehouse. It was a lovely house and a perfect place to raise his three kids, but also a listed building that needed very certain repairs, certain repairs that would suggest that a man who had a lot of love for the 1800s might be able to repair. And yeah. of course, with his love for, for, for things gone by, we mentioned his steam engine. Fred Dibner adored steam engines tom yeah he when did. he wasn't up a chimney he was fucking around with his 
1910 Aveling and Porter steamroller, which he purchased in poor repair back in the day before the kids for £150, as my dad would say, when £150 was a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. This was a beautiful steam engine. By the time we got to see it as an audience, it had been rebuilt in places from scratch tanks to Fred's impressive self-taught engineering skills. Because why would you ask somebody how to work a fucking lathe? <laughs> it was the pride of his life. And as audiences could plainly see a source of friction between Fred and Alice. And even though she never mentioned it all that much, Tom, you know, it was gritted teeth there. A lot of the time, you know what I mean? And I love that the BBC wouldn't have even set out. There was probably moments where, like, they would have left that out, you know, and go, you know what, maybe we shouldn't mention, maybe we shouldn't fucking leave in the fact that she's a bit wespy over this yoke. But, it, I mean, also, it's a testament to the fucking absolute authenticity of the man. All our outlets, every one of our outlets, has some project that is now rotting in a ditch somewhere. I, yes. I, I can guarantee you right now there are projects of mine that are rotting in a ditch somewhere that I never finished out. Because I am sitting in mine. Lit- yeah, and, and as am I. And I just, literally for professional reasons, I have to finish this. I have to finish yes. this. But I guarantee you that there'll be something not done because it, it's not absolutely fucking necessary. Like I know for a fa- right up there, there's a bit of torch on felt. I have to do it. I could have done it over the last three weeks. I have not done it yet. But what, what I'm saying is Fred went all the fucking way to buy an app like this. What the fuck? The thing must have weighed 10 tons. He went and bought the thing and actually cracked into it. You actually, know? I know how much it weighs. He mentioned it on his Desert Island discs. It was 16 tons. 16 tons. Jesus. Yeah. And, and I mean, for what Jerry's saying here, to say that this man did it from scratch, he didn't go out and buy bolts, you know. He no. physically cold-pressed and fucking forged bolts. Like... With a fucking French press, bang, 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 shit that would, again, practicing at these things, Jer. Like, I've done a blacksmithery course. Smithery? I don't know if that's the word. But you ain't going fucking next nor near half the gear she, the, it was a, it was a, uh, a woman, um, husband and woman blacksmiths. Legend. Again, dream job. They had a forge over in, near Blessington on the property of a manor house. So they got this courtyard. That was basically the workers' court. Oh, I was fucking glorious. I highly recommend it. But there was shit there where she was gone. Not one hope and fuck does our insurance even cover ye looking at that, let alone letting, yeah. you, letting you go at it. And I, I did metal work through school. I even still said, yeah, you're 100% right, missus. There are seven different ways I could lose your dick in that. And that's yeah. from outside the fucking door. And Fred, Fred did this shit and lost no digits, lost nothing. No, possibly got concussed by a few times, but that's you know, and it's the kind of thing, Tom, where everything is built from scratch. Not only did he have to rebuild the steam engine, and when we say a steam engine, it's a steamroller. It's if you've ever been into a thrashing fair or anything like that, it's the big, ignorant, coal fired boiler, uh, train on wheels, uh, cool as shit, steamroller, cool as shit, cool as shit. George the Steamroller from Thomas the Tank Engine, big ass fucking steam engine. Not only did he build that from scratch, he rebuilt it from scratch in a shed he built from scratch using tools and engineering equipment and forges that he built from scratch. I mean, the man was one step shy of mining the ore for it. Yeah, literally, yeah. Holy Jesus Christ. And he probably did for the crack. Do you know, because he was that auth- authentic, like, do you know, less... I mean, Authentic, authentic, Jesus, authentic, Christ which is, above. Which is one thing, but it really absolutely becomes apparent watching the eight episodes of Fred that the steam engine really is the other woman in oh, the yeah. relationship. Oh, yeah. Not for nothing, not for nothing, the, uh, reg- the, the, the license plate on it is Allison, which seems cute, but... Uh, Let's go on with the rest of the podcast. Tom. <laughs> <laughs> this is our this is the days of li- days of our lives moment where all of a sudden it's the very this is the end of the episode in days of our lives. Yes, like, where the steam engine and himself are caught in bed, and <laughs> an, an actual, actual Ellis walks in because you son of a bitch. Da-da-n. <laughs> because Alison really didn't seem to have much of a problem it has to be said she didn't really seem to have much of a problem watching her husband scale ladders and bring down brick chimneys on top of himself on a day to day basis so that was 
she had she had made peace with that. Yeah. But she also had to make peace with his love of this steam engine, which he would spend pretty much every available hour of the day with tinkering, rebuilding, and not for nothing, Tom, driving around <laughs> at painfully. <laughs> like it's one thing, Jared, if you want to get building, a, if you're building, you know, you're 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 building a race car. You're like, well, at least when we get it done, we can go for a serious burn. No, <laughs> no, I built this shed out here. It doesn't go anywhere, Tom. I'm still at the house. Well, Fred, uh, <laughs> Fred would go out for frequent drives in his steam engine on his days off, which was just an, another day he was away from the family, to be honest with you. Most of the time, sometimes, Tom, uh, as during the eight part Fred documentary, they got to go with him. Audiences at the show had a good, long, painstakingly long look at the family <laughs> going on on what I suppose could be described as a holiday. It was fucking rough, like, in all fairness now. <laughs> as Fred took the family to a steam rally in Cheshire from Bolton. Now, this isn't talking about putting the steam engine on the back of a low loader and driving it the distance. With his wife, three kids, and Jack Russell dog sitting on the platform of a renovated caravan, Fred towed the whole lot at an absolute fucking snail's pace down the road with the steamroller, facing into wafts of thick black smoke from the boiler and soaking up the impact of every bump on the road thanks to the absolute lack of suspension whatsoever. Tom, steel on concrete. This is zero creature comforts whatsoever this is driving a steamroller i was just i was just checking it's 36 miles from cheshire to bolton now this fucking york's doing about, about a mile an hour like it's it's, it's, it's brutal like we've all been absolutely brutal it's 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 i'm well i'm gonna in the next the next segment i'm gonna get into just how fucking brutal it is but what we have to say is Fred's in his element. Oh, and that's what's hilarious. He's fucking loving and cry, winding that wheel and tooting it on. And then he fucking covered from head to t- Like when you go on holiday, you don't expect to be fucking filthy. And that man is black from head to toe with fucking soot. And the f- <laughs> like, I, the only thing that I, I think it may have actually come up in conversation between my parents and me was we were watching it. And like my old man's thinking, oh, class. I remember we were in France uh, when we were small and we were having a nice holiday in France. And for some reason, my father remembered, or he was probably planning this all along, that he had like a second cousin, like his mother's cousin, who was a nun in some fucking village slash town near it. Four kids getting fucking dragged, because we went in the ferry, mind, getting dragged in a fucking Opel Cadet estate after a long fucking drive. And this is the first thing my old lad wanted to do was call and see or maybe say a couple of prayers. And my mother, needless to say, wasn't overly impressed. Of course not. But his neck got fucking wound in fairly fucking quickly. I can tell you with a, sh- a look that she would have, pro- no doubt I wouldn't have recognized myself at the time. I probably was only five or six. But I'd recognize that look now. That would oh, yeah. sh- shot him a look that would have frozen his fucking veins. And we finished up our tea fairly quickly and got the fuck back on the road. There was no more... But can you imagine the whole holiday was that? <laughs> like, <laughs> so, uh, well, well, there was nothing would freeze Fred's veins because he was standing in front of a fucking boiler engine, shoveling <laughs> coal into a fire, absolutely black, dirty from head to toe, while the family with the dog sat in this rickety caravan, wanderly wagon in the fucking back. <laughs> as they are passed out on the road by pedestrians. <laughs> it no. is... No iPads, Jer. You know, fucking brutal. <laughs> there is, it, it, it's it's painstakingly slow. Steel on, is, as you said, steel on steel on concrete, steel, steel on tar. There ain't no giving either one of those. There's no leaf springs on this thing like there might be on an old fucking trapping horse where they're you know that hard wheels. There's nothing. There nothing. is nothing. It's straight. It's straight steel to chassis to body. That's fucking it. So you're feeling. Every bang magnified, not actually every bang, but it's fucking magnified by the time it gets up to your little child's arse or wife's arse. They're in fucking ribbons and you've got four days of that carry on. And needless to say, all the carbon monoxide is blowing into your fucking... That's blowing straight into your face. I mean, Fred, it has to be seen every now and then. 
<laughs> I gotta give him his credit. He, he he turns around to the family and say, "We're going to pull up up here at an inn or a tavern or some such," and he has himself a pint and a sandwich, and the kids have pop and crisps. That's all very well and good, but he hasn't spoken to anybody on the journey for four hours. They're sitting <laughs> in the tavern. There with a big smile on his face, waving at pedestrians. And when they pull up at the fucking pub, everybody else is eating their crisps and eating their sandwich or whatever like that. And Fred is ch- chatting to like three eight-year-old boys who've come up to him going like, what's with the, you know, what can you tell us about the engine, mister? And Fred's with his back to the family, just chatting away to these three young lads. And then it's back on the fucking, on the steam engine, Tom. And it, it, what's better again is... I recently drove to Cork and back with the family for a holidays and I, I, I timed it. I didn't have to do one refuel and stop whatsoever. The whole time I was down there and we went to, we spun around the place, went to Tremor. We had a, we had a good journey. Okay. Fred had to stop and refill the boiler of the, um, of the steam engine every eight miles. That's how, <laughs> that's how far away. Think about, think about what, the, how this machine works. You boil water, it turns to steam, the steam turns to pistons and the thing goes. Okay. You boil water, it's going to go away. And how much water is this thing going to hold? He had to stop, open a fire. He had to keep an eye out for a fire hydrant every eight miles. Stop, get Alison out of the back with the kids, get the hose, run it into the into the tank of the steam engine, find a hydrant, open it. As he said himself, every now and then we have to open hydrants and dig out all the muck and shit and, and what knows out of it because it's in disrepair. And then connect. And he's, as he said himself, you know, that you're not supposed to be doing this. Strictly speaking, it's not legal. I'd say the statute of limitations is over. Nobody's going to chase him down for it now. Strictly speaking, it's not legal. But they should be thankful of the service we're doing them because we're clearing out the hydrants along the way. <laughs> this is the man's holiday. He's cleaning the hydrants <laughs> from Bolton to Cheshire. I actually re-looked at it there. That's the really fast way, the 35 miles. That's the motorway. Oh, yeah, now. And that's, I'm sure, he did not use the motorway today. He went to country roads. He went no, to back roads. It, like. I'm going to tell you, Tom, the journey was so long and so arduous that it takes up two episodes of the show. It's a fucking two parter. And it finally uh, reaches the rally where Alison immediately uh, goes with Fred to find a nice little coffee stand like an electric picnic and have a crepe and a donut with Fred at a coffee. Uh, stand at the at the steam rally. No, she fucking doesn't. No, Alison is left to make the dinner in the caravan <laughs> in the pissing rain with a leaking roof, while Fred is over chatting to all his fucking other steam engine buddies, having an absolute belter of the time, laughing and roaring and making jokes <laughs> and talking engines, and she is peeling spuds in a in a in a, a, a pouring water out of a five gallon drum to peel spuds for the dinner. I mean. If you if you were watching this at the time and you were to press the CFAX button, it would just be divorce papers to come. Yeah, up. yeah, yeah. I, I I don't know. My my wife is a tolerant woman, Tom. I know when not to push it. Yeah, Fred, that's not even pushing it. Or Fred's that's not even Jerry, pushing that's, it. That's that's not even pushing it. That's just straight no. up. That's steamrolling over it. You're on you're on two different things. St- <laughs> that's steamrolling over it. Oh in yeah, steamroller that you built yourself. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And just to add insult and injury, you're dragging your family with it as well, just to drive over their dreams. Like, I mean, like I said, there's been a lot of... I mean, Fred, that, the thing is, there's no badness in him. Just some guy... There's being, no badness in him. He's there's just no like, badness. He's he like, just, as far as he is concerned, you like the kids that, are having you know, a wonderful time. You enjoy and, and, yourself and, and, back there, love. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, and she's, you know, she's, she's his wife. She's not going to go, this is a load of shit in front of the kids because the kids might be having... Somewhat of it. I'm guessing the first the build up heading out on the road for the first four miles. Fucking gas. Everybody yes. burp, burp, blowing the horn, people waving. Oh, it's Fred Tibner, he's out there. You know, cameras. Of course it's gonna be exciting. There's cameras. We're going to be on telly. By mile yeah. f- by mile 16, Jer, after you've been four fills and probably maybe three or four other stops just for the hell of it, like you know, he didn't you know, just to stretch the legs uh, even. By start, mile 16, it's going to get fairly fucking bleak. I don't want to sit here and say that the three Dibna daughters didn't love their uh, four-day trip to a steam rally in the Pissons of Rain in Cheshire. I'm not going to say that, but all I will say is they don't appear to be having a great time on the TV. But, to his credit, that's not the only holiday that Fred takes during the eight-episode Fred documentary. Alison manages to coax him into going on a trip to Blackpool. <laughs> <laughs> and 
fuck me. Like, I've seen some TV in my time, Tom, but I've seen nothing like Fred Dibna in a pair of trousers and a wool jumper <laughs> making sandcastles with his daughter on Blackpool Beach looking absolutely, utterly fucking miserable. As oh. miserable as Alison and the kids looked in the caravan, that's how uncomfortable Fred looks now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it was, it was glorious to see it. His face was... Like, there's nothing he could do with that situation. It's like, oh, right. So, we, we're here then, that way. Oh, oh. Would you, anyone like another ice cream? Just just anything. Anything to go for a walk. Anything. You know, maybe there's some machinery that needs fixing. Oh, yeah, you don't need me around place. You, you know, I'll go and maybe fix a sink or something, yes. you know. I, you know, like it's, I mean, like we've all been in situations, Tom, where like, you know, you got to bring the kids somewhere, go yeah. do something. No, look, it'll be good for the kids. The kids will like it. And you're like, oh, fuck, I'm not going to like this. It's but you know suck. what? It would be good for the kids. You got to suck it up. You got to just do it, you know? Yeah. Uh, Fred doesn't appear to have that. And he does <laughs> offer, in an interview at the, on the beach where he's like in the absolute pissings and moanings of him, he does make some uh, gesture towards how he was... Uh, made go on holidays as a kid they just like stuck him on a coach and, and said go on your fucking holidays and go and he never liked it and he didn't like it he's carried that into uh adult <laughs> life yeah that has not left him that hasn't left him but he's you know he's just one of those frantic workaholics too like who's just so buried in his thing that he cannot see any progress or any point to what he's doing sandcastles on a fucking beach what am i doing here like literally literally he is right in one sense like sand castles. This isn't going to last for, you know, I like to fucking make things that last. This will yeah. literally, literally be gone in an hour. One Why? wave and this thing's gone. I mean, the man's not wrong. But never let it be said that uh, Fred wouldn't make good use of his time because yeah. as the documentary goes on to show Tom, uh, while he was in Blackpool, he fucking took a nixer. He not yeah, he did. Yeah, he did. I love that. <laughs> I fucking love that. On the family holiday, on one of the days, he loaded the family into the Land Rover and took them to a factory on the outskirts of Blackpool. <laughs> and with the ladders he had fucking brought with him from Bolton. Because you never know. Climbed and knocked a chimney over the course of a day while the family sat in the Land Rover in the pissing rain, <laughs> looking out at him. I love I that. mean, I love that. God damn fred <laughs> fucking help us a little bit and he didn't even oh well you know what tom hey you know what that was a nixer okay that probably paid for the holiday that's a good deal i'm gonna go on holiday gonna do this nixer and it's gonna pay for all the fucking donkey rides and ice cream and uh punch and judy shows and all this no tom he did this as a nixer to get a boiler plate for another fucking steam engine that he yes. just bought yes barter system the the Just... factory that had the chimney that needed to come down engineered uh cast iron boilers or some shit like this and he was like I could do with a bit of that how about I knock a chimney and I get like a dome from a fucking engine brilliant like when you think about it it's fucking brilliant but yes it when you look over to your left shoulder and you go oh wait oh my family are there nah, I can't do it that's what that's what just the, that's what the norm that's what a norm does. That, That's that, what a norm, that, that, a regular honestly, Joe. You know, that is what any divorce lawyer in the country would call Article 1. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that was it. You don't worry. You don't have to worry for the rest of all the Fred Dibna documentaries. Uh, have to worry again about Fred Dibna being on a beach because that was it for Fred and Holidays. Yeah. He said, fuck this, and refused point blank to head off with the family again, regardless of how many Nixers were available on the trip. That was just it. Boom, we're done. And just as it was that for Fred and Holidays, that was pretty much for Fred and his missus. In 1985, Alison took the girls by herself on a trip to Greece. And when she got home, said, Fred, fuck this. I want a divorce. Ending <laughs> 15 years of marriage. That's got to be one hell of a trip to Greece, I got to tell you. To be fair, that was that was a, a Shirley Valentine moment, if ever I heard it. You know, Mia culpa. Like, ever... Mia culpa says, Fred, you got to. You gotta hold your hands you, up you there. You gotta Fred. turn around and say, you know what? Uh I, I, I can't be mad at Alison at all. No. I I watched the woman on the fucking Wanderly wagon all the way to the steam rally and back. So when when um When she didn't walk on after that, 
like literally walk away. I, like 18 fucking years, she gave it a good, that's a good crack. She had to say at some stage over 18 years, Fred was going to fucking pull up and stop rooting with steam engines at the back. But as I mentioned up the way, Tom, he didn't stop rooting with steam engines. He bought a fucking another one. They had pit pumped all their money into renovating the first steam engine. And the minute that it's fixed, he buys another piece of scrap with the intention of spending another 14 years doing it up again. If you see that kind of writing on the wall, I got it. I got it. I'm not, you know, you know, I love Fred. I'm team Fred all the way. But at this one, you got to say, Alison, fair is fair. Well, I, to be fair, what I love is the notion that Fred is thinking, I'll name it. I know what I'll do. Keep it quiet. I mean, romantic too. I'll, I'll, I'll name it Alison. <laughs> you know, you know, like just to keep it quiet, man. You know, it'd be nice. Nice. What the fuck happens on Rig 2? Oh, well, I got, gonna, what's he going to call I, that actually, one? I know, the, I know the answer to this one. He named... I, I, I'm gonna, someone's going to correct me on this. He either named the second rig or the first... He renamed the first rig or named the second rig. He renamed it Betsy after his mother because, in his own words, they're not so quick to abandon you. It's oh, cold-blooded, oh. Fred. Oh, that's cold-blooded. Oh, jeez. Oh, that's, 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 right. that's in there with the dynamite, man. You know, that's in this, That's it, yeah. There's a bit of salt in there now. Ooh, spice. Oh, yeah. I like, I, you know, you, with the sweet, you need a little bit of spice every so often. I like that. But out of no badness, I think of either one, but I'm I'm with Alison on that one. 18 this years. straight down the middle. Give, given three daughters. And really, it was only, it was worse it was getting, you know. Fucking hell tonight. It's not better. It's getting they filed for divorce. It went through, and in order to pay and cover the divorce costs, Fred had to part company with his beloved AGS motorcycle that he'd talked to the vicar back in. Probably the day sold it to the vicar. Landers. He could have done. I mean, they have money, don't they? Oh yeah. I mean, he was able to pay him for that fucking weather van that time. Then he made a one piece of metal. Do you remember that one piece? Of I do. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, he made the yeah. thing out of one. Piece. Just, I'm just saying. If my, if my knowledge of England is anything to go by, that was paid for by like a fair where like there was like oh, yeah. coconut shies and shit. Well, there's that's a, how it works over there, isn't it? That's how lot, the economy works over there. Pretty much. You need to fix a church roof, you have a fair, right? Yeah, yeah. You make some scones, clotted cream, and hey presto, where put it, get on shit your pants for itself. Hash. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that and wealthy, very wealthy Protestants like the likes of John, Jonathan Swift here in Ireland will donate a hell of a t- ton of money towards the church just to have their name etched on the wall. Because they like money just goes straight to fucking motorbikes and fucking weather vanes. Straight and the goodly portion goes into the pockets of the Fred Dibness of this world. Yeah. Where it can be spent on steam engines and divorces. (laughs) (laughs) I love do you know what I love is that with the steam engine and and he was constantly upgrading and doing this and the and the Land Rover never changed. He kept that fucking 90, that that Defender 90 pickup. Yes, fucking non-crew cab. Although it would have a bench seat, so you could cram the family in if they were skinny enough. Like, but <laughs> I mean, I love that he he just never he never thought I'll upgrade the jeep. Maybe get and a fucking- uh, throughout all this through the through the through the divorce through the trips away through Everton, the man is waking up every single day and climbing a three hundred fucking foot chimney. Yeah, knocking it down. He's uh he's lighting fire pits. It's just his day's business. Just knocking chimney after chimney. And like, you know, we could talk all day about chimney after chimney, but like really the gist of it is Fred lights a, knocks a fucking whole load of holes out at the bottom of a chimney, uh, lights a fire, stands back, and it comes crashing down. And the BBC rolled camera on every single one of these. There's just dozens upon dozens of shots of Fred walking like a fucking Terminator. Out of the out of the park. I sent you that clip. I'm gonna I'm gonna have to tweet it now. Keep an eye out for it on our socials. So, although his wife may have tired of uh, Fred's enthusiasm for steam, the public certainly hadn't. Fred continued to be an attraction on TV with another series called A Year with Fred in 1987, followed by Life with Fred in 1994. All we, what do we see in these shows, Tom? We see chimneys going down. We see Fred going up. But by the time Life with Fred hit the airwaves in 1994, Fred had remarried to Susan Lawrence, who he met at, where the fuck else would he meet her, Tom? A steam rally. Before inviting her to, where the hell else would he invite her to, Tom? A chimney felling. I mean... <laughs> hey, if you're a young comic and you're pretty good at comedy, where's the first place you're going? You're going to meet her at a comedy club or you're going to invite her to a comedy club? 
you know, or vice versa. If you're a girl, you're meeting a guy or whatever, you know, it's, it's, it, that's, you're going to bring him to your chaise. You're going to bring him to where you're the big dog. You know what I mean? You're, he's the biggest dog in Bolton at this carry on. I mean, like it's 1994 when he's, when he's, uh, well, 1994, we say we meet her around about 1993. What's on in the cinema in 1993? I mean, Fred's not taking her to fucking, oh, how are you? Jurassic Park. Do you want to go see Clear and Present Danger? Like, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 haven't, I haven't been to the pictures myself in a couple of years, but uh, the kids tell me, you know, Donald, Donald himself, he said it, you know, as a clear and present danger, which in fairness, <laughs> is, it, it's kind of describes my life, actually. <laughs> you know, I suppose it ends, you know, but I haven't killed anybody yet, Jerry, you know, so <laughs> would you like to go see it? I'll get you a pop. Would you maybe, with some popcorn, uh, you know? It, would you like to go see Clear and Present Danger or would you like to f- come with me and be in Clear and Present Danger <laughs> while I knock this fucking chimney down? <laughs> but hey, you know, let's, Tom, we can't, we can't, we can't fault the man. It worked. He met Susan Lawrence, took her to a chimney felon. And uh, after that, Tom, what did she get? Uh, half a day out in a, a registry office, you know, like. <laughs> <laughs> We're crowbarring it in now, Jeff, but I'm happy. I don't care where he's going. I want to do half a day out, you know. I don't care. So we'll off have to half days out anywhere. Off to the registry. Well, office. we're going to give. Let's let's give Fred two half days out at the baptismal font because with Susie, Fred had two sons. Jack was born in 1987, so I guess he wouldn't have. Met, uh, I guess I got my, my years wrong. He did wouldn't have courted her in 1993, so he wouldn't have seen clear and present danger. Podcast is falling apart. Let's hear Tom. Uh, <laughs> Jack born in 1987 and Roger born in 1991. Fred is now in his mid 50s. We still get in work repairing the few chimneys that haven't been demolished, but they're getting scarcer every year. This is the problem with being good at what you're at, Tom. Fred's knocking chimneys. Nobody's building chimneys. This is on a road to nowhere, Tom. This is on a hiding to nothing. But Fred's not going to be out of work. He's a celebrity at this stage. Mm-hmm. And to bolster his income, you know. When he's not cleaning chimneys, which he also did, I'm not talking about actual chimney sweep work at houses. Fred would lean on his celebrity to book public speaking jobs, such as after dinner appearances, and also found himself hosting kids' art competitions and even judging a local cat show. <laughs> Can you? Ima- that would be one of the greatest I, things I, of all time to see Fred Dibner no, judging I, a cat got- show. Tom, I do not have to imagine that. There's footage. Is there? Is there? There is footage of Fred judging a cat show, and it's as mesmerizing as you like. And it's so the 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 show that it's in, the episode that it's in, it's like a hard cut from Fred up a chimney, knocking out blocks, to Fred in a community <laughs> center. <laughs> oh. Oh, I see, you know, oh, she's, a, she's a Persian, I see, you know, you know, I like it, it's a bloody nice cat, you know, she, she looks like a chim- you know, chimney brush, she's, oh, she's a, oh, how do you, how do you keep them so clean, you know, can't keep me keeping myself clean. <laughs> oh, my God. What, 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 would you, what, what would you give, it, what would you give this cat out of 10, Fred? Oh, <laughs> I'd give it half to out. <laughs> <laughs> ah, for fuck's sake, man. Uh, but it is like we've talked about some worst gig ever experiences, Tom, where uh, you and I have been called on to do something other than comedy and go fucking host a lovely girls competition. And it's the road to nowhere. That's the look on Fred's face when he's here judging our competitions and shit like this. Yeah. But you know what? He's on his second marriage at this stage. He's got a steam engine that needs a boilerplate like and there's not as many chimneys to fix as he would like. So what's a man to do? What's a man to do is right. You got to suck you know, it up and take some of these shit gigs because, you know, I, 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 I hear him here judging local cat shows and I'm like, Fred, buddy, who books that? Like, come on. Yeah, I'll take, I'll take But also, like, who thought, you know, we get, we get Fred Dibner. Fred it's, Dibner. It, we get this him. This is what it is. Local celebrity Fred Dibner. In, in one of the earlier documentaries, uh, he opens... um. He opens like a, 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 he opens a branch. He cuts the red tape on a branch of like a fucking Oxfam or some shit like that. I mean, say what you want about Fred. I got to tell you this, Tom. I mean, like who would book him for this? Why wouldn't he turn it down? He turns nothing down. Yeah, it's true. He turns nothing. He took a fucking gig on holidays for the price of a belly plate. 
Like he turns nothing down. I did I did watch an after dinner speech with him. It was for were they model trains appreciation society or something? It could be anything, Tom. It could be like a fucking local cricket club hall of fame inauguration ceremony. We'd get Fred Dibn up to fucking give to us be, half the with an Undertaker joke. To be fair, it wasn't a million miles off something that he might be interested in, but it was like it was very like they would call it you know, to be a fucking Norse that something is to be an absolute fucking anorak. This was a room full of middle-aged anoraks with, yes. you know, the trousers pulled way to a tie, like like zero style in the room. And it just, the camera pans. But, so I'd like to uh, I'd like to give it over now to uh, uh, Mr. Fred Dibner, everybody. And it's like this, you know, this pe- clap, pe- yeah. people that don't even know how to fucking clap, they're so weak from you know onion soup or whatever else <laughs> and you're thinking I, I hadn't looked down at the time on the on the clock on youtube and he's, he stands up and he has his no hat on and i go fuck fred's bald of course he's bald but like who yeah fuck? he's an old man at this stage fred's bald right fred's bald and next thing the whole gag it was you know he's done it a hundred times he's like oh hello, oh Excuse me one second. And he flicks on the hat and it's like, it's fuck. It's basically, <laughs> it's basically the Hulkster ripping the shirt. You know what I mean? Yes. It's like, I am a rebel Jordan, Fight for the rights of every steeple check. It's ridiculous. He slaps it on, you know, full well. It's, he has it down to it, the timing. I'm making it. And he goes, of course oh. he does. Oh, and he kind of gives the glasses a bit of a, you know, a bit of a lift. And he, oh, now we can see you. Like he needed a hat to see the room like it. Exactly. Now I'm, but he was right. He put on his uniform. He got in the fucking mold. Like who knew what he was going to say, but he got up and I mean, he talked solid with no support, no music, no spotlight, no, you know, no nothing. Pint in front of him, cap on. He talked solid for an hour. No bother. I was very, too, too good for these fuckers, to be honest with you. Too good for him. All of the years you've known me, Tom, why I always say to you, I can't fucking knock the hustle. No. I can't knock the hustle of Fred going out and taking every after dinner gig, kids competition, judging, cat show, every single thing you want. Because the, what he really loved, the steam and the steeplejacking wasn't what it used to be. And as much as Fred would have loved the history of steam and industry to repeat itself, it was unfortunately a much more unwelcome history that actually did. Marital woes, Tom. <laughs> Citing a lot of the issues that our predecessor Allison had pretty much said, Susan Dibna left Fred for another man and shacked up in the Isle of Man, taking his sons Roger and Jack with her and leaving a heartbroken Fred alone with his steam engines again. Some guys again, Tom. Yeah, JR. Some Die fellas. Hard too. How does the same shit happen to the same guy twice? Some fellas just ain't built for some things, JR. You know, some fellas ain't made for things and. Society told this man that he needed to meet and marry a woman. And with all the best intentions, he did. And was going to keep her and, you know, treat her right and everything else. But out of no badness. Jesus Christ almighty, though, Fred. You're out there again. And, you know, okay, she shacked up with another fella. She headed off. Listen, if you ain't around for... If you're not around... And, you know... You know, there's gonna Ruby's a... going to take her love to town. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Now you're fucking talking... I mean, she painted you know, up her lips and curled and yeah, rolled her tinted I'll, hair. I'll, I'll, although Fred wasn't uh, doing his patriotic chore in a, in a foreign war that left him incapacitated. No, he was Fred's out fucking the underneath, a, underneath, a, underneath a fucking steam engine. Yeah. With Cold hot slag bolts. dropping down on top yeah, of him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, uh, As I, I always thought, it, uh, what I will say about this one particular one strikes me as better that she, she fucked off to the Isle of Man. I got to tell you, uh, I think Fred Dibner would have loved the Isle of Man. Oh, you would have loved it. It's a bit wild. Yeah, big, yeah. big load of steam, steam engines. It's got that big wheel. He'd have, find, he'd have found something to do there. Bit of a sickener. Would have been easier probably on him if he moved, if she moved to London. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Oh, London. You know, city folk. Yeah. yeah, I think. But you listen, I know, guys, there's a guy, there are men living not fucking five miles from me right here. And they are, they are cut from the same mold. And one particular guy, I think they, you know, They've they kind of found each other again, but for a good thirty years, him and the wife, nope. <laughs> she would have she sat in the in the van when he went in for pints, and you know it was just a long drawn out thing where she didn't see him. Forestry man, not really built for the whole thing, but I think since then, you know, he's kind of come to his senses and 
and whatnot. But several blokes, several blokes never married. Oh, yeah. No, one, this is one lovely man just passed away recently. Tractor man mad for tractors. Couldn't marry a woman because sure, what woman would stick with you? And he was right. He wasn't sure. He was right. Hey, it, hey, isn't, well it ain't for me. Man. It ain't for me. He, he clocked it, he registered it, and, and away he went. But like Fred just seems to have said, Look, to complete this package, I need a wife in the house. And uh, you know what? As he learned again, it just doesn't uh, work out. Now, the second one, it seems to have been uh, pretty hard on Fred because he wasn't with this lady quite so long. Allison yeah. was probably a long knife, probably seen that one coming. That yeah, was water dripping on a rock. You know what I mean? That wasn't. Yeah. Fred would have seen the signs years ahead. You know, years. This ahead. one, perhaps, uh, this one, perhaps a bit more sudden. And she took her two. Uh, his two boys away as well, which he has said was a was a was a bitter disappointment. So it was a rough time for Fred. He's getting older. His profession is becoming, for all intents and purposes, obsolete. And the BBC had more or less decided that, with you know, good ratings notwithstanding, when it comes to TV shows about a man in a boiler cap and a flat cap climbing up the side of a chimney, we're good. We're good. I, I, the Fred Dibner race is a, pretty much wrong. A cup o- overfloweth. We are fine. Yeah. For, yeah. Yeah. I get it. We've seen them coming down. All right. But Fred wasn't done yet. Not on TV, not up chimneys and not up the aisle either, Tom. In 1996, while giving a tour of his steam engine shed in his garden, the then 58-year-old Fred met former magician's assistant Sheila Grundy when she brought her steam mad son Nathan to see Fred's steam workshop at his house. And the pair began a whirlwind romance that ended at the altar in 1997. 20-year age gap be damned, my man. Tell you what, sir, fair, eh? You got to give it to him in one way. Like, you know, he's still got a bit of fire in the old box. Like, you know, there's... He's, he still knows how to keep a piston going, Tom. Yeah, he does. Yeah, he I mean, does. I, I just mentioned that there that, uh, you know, they, they, they met Fred at his house because Fred's house wasn't in a gated community or anything like that. That was Fred Dibner's house. If yeah. you want to meet Fred Dibner, he's out the back of it nine times <laughs> out of ten. <laughs> yeah. And Whereas... he'll gladly show you his steam engines or anything like that. So, like, while Allison and... Um, and uh, Susan were both had their fair share of watching their husband through the back window out giving complete fucking strangers a tour of his steam engine just because they rocked up and said hello. That's how he met his third wife, Sheila. She rocked up with her son, Nathan, who loved steam, said, Fred, can we see your steam engine? He said, absolutely. And what do you know? Yeah. I mean, a kid would have been pretty happy with the situation, too. Now, local celebrity. Yeah, no. Guy's got all his cool shit. It's basically like fucking to, to the kid at the time. It's like, you know, fucking Top Gun. You know, you're going in there. <laughs> do you know, love steam engines. Now, you could see it wearing off as the years would go by. But at the same time, like, cool as shit. Oh, yeah. That, yeah. Get, 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 get that kid into his teens. And especially at the year that it is, 1996, PlayStation's coming out. Oh, you yeah. Know. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, for fuck's get to sake, 99, yeah. PlayStation 2 hits. Give or give or take. But, hey, regardless of which... Fred is reinvigorated. He's got a new uh, lady on his arm. So he's launching into the second half, or the later half, I should say, the second half. This that's on his fucking Act 5. Uh, the last half of his career, both as a steeplejack and a TV celebrity. Mm. So there's no interest really, Tom, truth be known, in the British public to see Fred climbing chimneys anymore. And indeed, there's very few chimneys left to climb. Fred had built up almost 30 years of good fate collateral with the British TV watching audience who had come to know him as a straight talking man of the people with a vast wealth of knowledge on a wide array of historical sub of historical subjects. So yeah, okay, we're done with you climbing up chimneys, Fred, but we know you, we like you. What else have you got? So Fred teamed up with a writer called David Hall and the pair devised and quickly sold an idea for a TV concept, which may be one of the purest no brainers of all time. Send Fred around the country to various heritage sites and working monuments to the bygone era of steam and industry and have him introduce a whole new audience to it. Yeah. What is the what is the problem here? Fred Dibner's Industrial Age was released in 1999 and was an instant ratings smash. Whose dad was not going to watch this? It was quickly followed by Fred Dibner's Magnificent Monuments, Fred Dibner's Building of Britain, Fred Dibner's Age of Steam, as well as many other guest spots on other related shows. I mean, fuck me, Tom. Yeah, no. Uh, yeah, you stick to... Yeah, you don't go off sa- outside the rails. Why would you go outside the rails? For the love of Jesus Christ. I mean, the man. 
but he like he had the now he was into the grandfather part of his life too he was adorable he'd gone from just being funny and cool and gas and and likable now he was into the adorable part of his life and you believe a man who has a pocket watch Ger. you know what i mean he had a yes. fucking pocket watch and a waistcoat and a nice jacket and he's so enthusiastically talked about ruddy great pistons, you know, maybe 30 foot high. When you look at it and you could, you could, you bought into every moment. Like I every said, bit of it. Outside Leicester, we went to one of the museums that he actually had on the show. And my girlfriend at the time, now my wife, as a direct result of that moment where she thought, well, hey, if Tom's into this, let's go see these pistons. I was, we were the only people in the museum and we basically met Fredites there. All <laughs> I Fred swear heads. To, Fred heads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These guys, they were so into this shit. But to be fair, it was so well put. Like it the Brits do a museum well. It oh, was so cool. Like her Natasha was just she was all into it five minutes in. She was like, I get it. I fucking get it. I get it. I get it. This is just uber cool. The level, like the fucking level of engineering. I mean, it's it's upsetting now how easily they can do things to create power and whatnot. When you see the weird, like this was what used, it took. Jesus Christ, what it took to even manufacture the things that created power. Like you talk about an eight foot diameter piston, 50 foot high. Do you know, two of them driving a shaft, driving a crank, like unbelievable. But again, it was purely based on Fred that the love, my Fred moment, and I got to see this museum. I'm buzzing for the weekend, buzzing. I can only imagine, uh, Tom, and uh, and I gotta tell you, I hope uh, we're we're due over in uh, mainland England very shortly ourselves if the COVID holds up, and I intend to visit a few of them myself. Oh yeah, absolutely do. You won't, and they do it so well. You know what I mean? They do it. Oh, so they do. Well. Yeah. Ugh. And Fred did it so well, Tom. I mean, like, you know, we said earlier that this was an absolute fucking slam dunk, no brainer. Why wouldn't you get Fred Dibner to do this? But there was one person that didn't really believe it would be a hit. And that was Fred himself. He was fucking terrified about presenting to camera. I mean, this is a man that we've seen for 30 years climbing up the side of chimneys and hanging one hand off with a woodbine in his mouth. And there we say it, a pint or two on board by his own admission. I'm not yeah. making that up. Well, but, but like, you know, he just admitted claiming uh, uh, having a few pints at lunchtime and going up gave him that kind of dark player focus to get to the top of the chimney but regardless of that you stick a camera in front of this man to present directly down the camera uh that's when he started getting the jittery but he needn't have worried tom he fit right into this role and all of a sudden this is a new era of fred dimna this is where he becomes known as the man that didn't tear down uh, monuments to british history he celebrated their preservation and uh you know, really could be the guy that was good at it. Yeah, but he was like, I mean, he ushered it in for people that I would have never considered. There's a few done since, you know, of the industrial era, but they was very, they were very over dramatized. It was a guy, oh Jesus, he's been in loads of things. He's kind of a goofy looking tall comic actor. And he would talk, I can't remember his name. Christ, I should, I should have looked it up, but, and he would, he was very enthusiastic about it. It was funny how they shot it. They would nearly shoot him kind of down the way, looking down but Fred, often they would shoot it up. You know, they would shoot it slightly up rather than straight on with Fred. And it was almost, it's almost like Fred was part of the machinery. You know, the, like, yes. not to get too arty about it. Like, but and but he, he's in there. But and, also and, the and, fact and, that he would know how to build every fucking one of them. He wasn't just oh, some gawpy mouthed fucking flute with a script. He knew how every single one of them was built and could do it if he needed to, you know, and had done some similar things like. And and unless you unless you stop and think, okay, we got quickly, well, we didn't get quickly bored of Fred climbing chimneys and knocking them down. But like you know, how much can we uh, get entertainment from Fed visiting uh, eight foot pistons, Tom? Good and all as well. These shows aren't just about that. There's episodes where he visits, he visits fucking roller coasters in Blackpool and oh. gets to know the intricacies and the workings of roller coasters and goes on them. And, and, and like, you know, he didn't want to go on any of the roller coasters with his kids, caused fucking divorce back in the day. But now, <laughs> I love you know, that. You like, get, yeah, yeah. You can't get the fucker off them. <laughs> I love that. Like, he's flying around. And it's only thing about the roller coaster, not that it was absolutely terrifying that he was going to, again, how do you scare a man with fucking ice in his veins? Like when it comes to these situations, but he actually got talking to the operator. He goes, you know, it was a very bumpy, hard ride, you know, this cheeky cunt coming out with that after yeah. dragging his family from fucking Bolton to Chester. 
on a fucking for the, solid cast iron. The first thing he says when he gets off a roller coaster is he has notes on how to make it smoother. Yeah. <laughs> can, you not, can you not stick a couple of springs in? You know. And, oh I, my God. and I love I loved the guy's response to him. He goes, ah, it's when it warms up throughout the day. You know, he says the metal gets a bit more flexible and softens out no end. And Fred's, yeah. that's a good enough answer for Fred. You and I would go, excuse me, what now? So throughout the day, the metal bends and gets softer. Well, that's just lovely. And you still up. and you still put people up on this. Yeah, I'll I'll sorry, I'll I'll have eight thirty a.m. spin, please, if that's okay. I I I don't. But again, you see his little head flying around like, and he's he damn he good reactions too. The hat nearly came flying off him. He still caught it like it's 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 absolutely priceless. And all those series of shows, I mean, like it's wonderful that they remain there as a testament to uh, Fred Dibner's love of steam engines and of industry and all that. Because Tom, it has to be said. He may have built up a bubble around himself for years and decades with his steam engines out the back of the house, but it had to be said the industrial setting that he grew up with was truly gone by the wayside at this stage. We're into the early 2000s, and at this stage, audiences had been watching Fred on the TV for 25 years, and indeed it had been 40 years since he pointed that first chimney back of the way. The work he'd spent his life doing just wasn't there anymore, Tom. Save for a few church roof repairs or a weathercock here or there, there was nothing for this man to do. Man of the work had dried up. What did actually remain didn't have the same appeal to Fred, who's now in his 60s, don't know, don't you know? He can't really ladder a chimney the manner he'd done for 40 years. And don't get us wrong, Tom, he'd have fucking given it a go. Yeah, he would. But with new equipment and new regulations, it meant that his way of doing things were close to being outright outlawed. Yeah. I mean, this is where we get to the later videos where we see Fred in a high-vis vest. I know. So and wrong. So wrong. It's you're as well smeared the man with cow shit. He's just looks so uncomfortable. He's like, What is this? What am I? There's 15 people around him telling him how to do his job. Uh, the crowds are shamefully a safe distance back, and Fred just looks like he doesn't want any more part of it. Either leave me alone to do it my way, or I'm not doing it anymore. Yeah, and for no, not for nothing, the man's in his sixties. I mean, it's about time that he got down on the horse. Yeah, but you know what? You can't tell a fucking dog to stop being a dog. Like, you know, it's it's fucking Fred. It's fucking Fred, man. And all of a sudden, now you're gonna go. Now I'm sorry, Fred, but we're going to have to all this help and say, you know all that shit that you didn't bother with that still got the you know he still got the job done. We want to do all that, Fred. Slow you right up and take. Take the artist brush out of your hand, Fred, and tell you how you're going to fucking do it. The have artist. You con- have you considered dynamite, Fred? That would have been it. That no. would have been it. I think we what? never saw Fred lose his temper, but I reckon, <clears throat> I reckon he would have had that. That would have been it. That would have been it. And this was it, Tom. In the summer of 2004, after 40 years and 90 chimney drops, Fred Dibner was called upon to fell his last chimney, a 200 foot stack in Oldham. Clearly emotional, but professional to the end, Fred executed a textbook demolition using his time-honoured fire pit method, completing his career without ever, not once, despite what you may have heard, despite what many believe to this day, quote-unquote, blowing up a chimney. He did not blow up chimneys, Tom. We said it back in the way. Don't say that Fred Dibner blew up a chimney. He never blew up a chimney in his life. He was a feller. Of chimneys. He was an artist. He wasn't going to took him down, Tom. He took him down with honor and pride. Because he, he loved those fucking chimney stacks, like I talked about in the past. He loved them. You know, it it that's what I was saying about uh the the uh, the shows where he made where he celebrated industry and such like that's what he would love to be remembered for. But everybody loves the spectacle and everybody immediately goes, Yeah, Fred Dibna, knock down chimneys. No, he didn't knock down chimneys. He laid them to rest, Jared. That's what he did. He laid them to rest. Yeah. He brought them down. Because, I mean, the blood. So he understood the blood, sweat and tears that went into building those chimneys. Every last thing. And as he said, you know, like the conscientious hunter. Who's to say, you know, that he didn't have. Also, he may have had a contract lined up for selling those bricks on afterwards because they're sure shit were absolutely fine. Because he landed, I would say 99% of those bricks would be absolutely grand. I'll be a bar a few. He blasted out at the bottom to make the open mouth. You know, the, the, the cut at the bottom. But I guarantee you, I guarantee you, the hell of a lot of those bricks possibly went back into building whatever that chimney was clearing space for. You, you said there, Tom, that uh, 
he uh, he laid those chimneys to rest. One could say that those chimneys got a half day out with Fred. <laughs> Going all the way back to his Undertaker roots, just putting out. There putting you it, go. There you go. And we're not we're not done with that gag yet because 2004 was a landmark year in the life of Fred Dibner. Not only did he fell his last chimney, but he also met the Queen when he was awarded an MBE for services to history and broadcasting. Other words. Half day out with, you know, Her Majesty the Queen, <laughs> if you know what I mean. Well, yeah. <laughs> Fred had intended on the day to drive his steam engine into Buckingham Palace to collect his medal. I mean, why wouldn't you drive this thing in? Of course, though, he, he met with his uh, mortal enemy, Red Tape. He was informed that this was against royal regulations and he would not be allowed to drive what was, for all intents and purposes, a 16-ton bomb onto the grounds of Buckingham Palace. He's a fucking national treasure. you fucking joking me. Jesus Christ. Let him in there. Let him drive whatever the fuck he wants. I mean, like, if he had if he had driven it in, Tom, within minutes of firing it up and driving it, he would have been absolutely drenched in soot-covered water. And I'd say he would have been quite fine with that. You know what? I mean, this is why there's such a dis- disdain and, dis- you know, detraction between the likes of the Royals, you know. And the, That's why oh, the Royals will never have a 100% approval rating. Yeah, of course they won't. Don't you look at it, like, from a promoter's point of view and go, you know what, guys? Yes, he ain't our fucking bag. But the people we want to appeal to, they fucking love him. Although they would saying, love to see that. It's saying that if the royals and the, you know the the upper middle, the upper class at the time actually genuinely wanted to be appealing to the people of Britain, they would have let him in. But they don't. They don't care because they don't need to. Because yeah, people do. from the north, the backbone of the UK, the people from the fucking north of England, the umbo fucking salt of the earth people who built those chimneys, worked in bleach factories, worked in fucking boot polish factories. They serviced and kept people alive. They kept them wealthy. They kept the, the fucking people wealthy, but they, you know, they meant nothing to him. Fred should have been honoured and should have been allowed to drive his fucking, his Alison, or, you know, later to be known, Betsy, into fucking Buckingham Palace. Christ, give Lizzie a spin in the fucking thing. Do you know, she's a country woman by all accounts. Give her a fucking... I mean, it's, uh, like, you know, I'd say at least one of them would have loved to go on it. But, like, you know, at, at the same time, like, I can kind of see that point. I mean, you know... Give him a limited a... amount of water, Jer. Figure out how much water the fucker needs to make a hundred yards inside the gate and turn it. And then it's got to cut out. You know what I mean? Pull the claws on the cat. I'm not arguing. I'm not arguing, Tom. I mean, like, you know, I I can see why, like, you would not allow a man to drive his own boiler engine that he built. He's not a man. He's a legend. For the love of Jesus Fred Christ. Dib- Fred Dibner MBE come the end this of this. This is a man thing. who climbed 282 feet up the fucking bridge to put a Union Jack up there. He served twice Her Majesty's services. Twice yeah. he, he went. It's a fucking, it's a fucking war hero right there. He's fixing not, barns not, out and fucking. I'm not arguing with you. I'm like I wouldn't, uh, you know, if the thing had blown up in Buckingham Palace, I wouldn't be arguing with you then either. He never killed anyone. Yeah, never killed. I never killed the queen. I bet you the queen would have wanted it too, because they take a lot of that stuff out of our hands. I bet you she was like, "Who oh, drive it in? Drive it in? Oh fuck it! I want to get on that thing." But I guarantee you, he went. I'm sorry, madam, it's against regulation. How is that written in regulation anyway? Is that actually on a book somewhere? Uh, things that you can't actually drive. Fuck, yeah, fucking steam engine is there, lads. So, sorry. Fuck it. How do you want... He can come in on the back of a fucking hippo if he wants, but steam engine on him. Sorry. If you were to ask me, like he should have been able to enter the grounds of Buckingham Palace riding a cloud of debris from a nearby chimney that he <laughs> Like monkey. <laughs> like back in the... <laughs> Do you know what? Failing that, and I think even Queenie would have been okay with it, he should have been allowed to drive his fucking maroon with hand-painted fucking signage on the side. Ladders that, and all. I would have, I would have accepted the Land Rover. Hey, fucking, because old Philip, do you see the modified 130 he had? He, mod- he modified his own 130 Defender, the long, long fucker of a one, into a pickup. So his coffin could be put in the back of it. He didn't go in a hearse. He went in the back of a fucking 130 Defender. There should have been an alternative. Something to say, Fred, Fred. Fred doesn't walk into places. He fucking... Let him climb the fucking gates on, a, on one of his ladders. Something. Well, while you, while you do happen to mention hearses, Tom, I'm afraid that we have to announce that 2004 was also, sadly, the year that Fred Dibna passed away from cancer at the age of 66 having first been diagnosed with bladder cancer after suffering complaints three years previously. Fred had worked through his illness as much as he could, but eventually it overcame him and he died on November the 6th in Bolton Hospice, surrounded 
by his family. And very sadly, he actually had his half day out with The Undertaker, you know. Like, Finally you know. got his half day out with The Undertaker. Maybe. Fred's remains were taken to Bolton Parish Church by his faithful steam engine. They'll let you drive it into the grounds. Goddamn right. Goddamn right. right. Okay, so Bolton Parish won Buckingham Palace zero by my count. He was brought in by his fateful steam engine with his trademark flat cap lying on his coffin as it was drawn through the streets he'd run through as a boy and towered over as a man. The years following Fred's death were, of course, as these things can tend to be, unfortunately, awash with tabloid shenanigans surrounding his will, his family's dislike and disdain for his third wife. And we're not going to get into that, Tom, because you get out of the realms of fact and get into the realms of speculation. And, you know, we're going to leave that aside because it's apparent that off-screen Fred was a very complex individual who couldn't devote the same amount of his life to his wives that he could to his pastimes. But despite this, Fred remains one of Britain's most beloved characters, a genuine one-of-a-kind who always walked with one foot rooted in a world that he was born to later. on. And while we can speculate what kind of successes of mind as sharp and intelligent as Fred Dibnes would have produced if he had been born in the 1800s like he absolutely would have wanted to be, what we can say for certain is that Fred to his dying day did everything he could to introduce and educate a rapidly changing, careless world to the intricacies, artistry and beauty of a world powered by steam, coal, iron and fire. Fantastic. And that's exactly it, isn't it? Couldn't have summed it up better myself. That's exactly him. The artist. Yeah. 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 The artist the Fred Dibner. He We're was. We're not going to get into, I mean, like, you know, there's a hundred sun headlines after. Oh, about fuck all that. No, and, no. Oh, that was out of his control. And all this kind of shit. was control. gone at that stage. Uh, he was a very ill man at the end of his days and there was all kinds of shit going on that, like, you know what? We're not up until this point. We've had Fred's word for everything, and we don't have his word for it now. We're just going on what everybody else says. We're not even going to get into that. Uh, the man did his service to the country. Perhaps not as good a husband as he was a steeplejack. I don't think that's in any dispute. But what a what a life, what a career, and what a legacy. And hey, what a podcast, Tom. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm very very excited by that. Nobody can touch us for this. Nobody can touch us for this. Nobody has even made an attempt to do a podcast. On Fred Dibner. The, honestly, it, we're and I'm open for correction on that. If there is, uh, if there is another podcast that discusses the life of Fred Dibner, send it to me. I want to hear it. I absolutely want to hear it. I'm going to throw that in heavy rotation. If not, if you are joining us from any of the Fred Dibner appreciation pages on Facebook, uh, we hope you enjoyed it. We hope we did the man a good service. I hope you don't mind our Irish humor coming in here and there. I hope Tom's accent did the man proud. I laughed. I, I mean, in my years that are here right now, I think I'm doing a fantastic job. But also, I am very, very, as a comic, I'm very aw- self-aware of the fact that I could be absolutely making a hodgepodge of it. And I mean, given the, the engineering perfection that Fred typically turned out, I can only apologize on his behalf. But it's just, you know, we're comics at the end of the day. We ain't no fucking rocket, science, rocket surgeons. And all I can say is hopefully now our listeners enjoyed the show and get a bit of a glimpse as to what the rest of season six of the Tom and Jerry show is going to sound like. We've got a whole pile more episodes that uh, that we've put a whole bunch of work into and we can't break, wait to bring them to you. We thought Fred was the best way to, to get that out to us. But stick around. We've got so much more great content over the rest of the uh, of the season. To keep abreast of it, you can follow us on our social media channels at Tom and Jerry show will get you pretty much everywhere on Instagram and on Twitter. Jerry with a G for you English people. You can follow me on Twitter at Jerry McBride, Tom at Tom underscore O'Mahony and something similar to that will get us on Instagram as well. We'd also like to give a big shout out to our man Rob Steers for his wonderful artwork on our social pages, our new Tom and Jerry logos. We fucking love them so much. If you like the cut of Rob's jib, he's got a whole bunch of stuff for you to peruse Find him on social media at Rob Steers, S-T-E-A-R-S. He's got a whole bunch of stuff. Cards, greeting cards, prints, the whole lot. And even commissions if you talk to him, right? Other than that, Tom, what else would we like these fine people to do? If at the very least, all you can do from now on is to pass on the good news of this podcast. Tell people about it. Simple as that. Share it on whatever platform you're using. Maybe tag us in it too. That'd be ideal. Also, if you do have the ability to leave a comment, That'd be great. I think you can do it. It's coming on Spotify. You can definitely do it on Apple. I think possibly you can do it over on Acast. If you can, please do. If you can, give us a rate. 
give us a five star rate. Again, not really because of our fucking ego needs it, but the more five star ratings it gets, the more visible it comes, the more people we become, the more effort and time we can put in to actually create more content for you. And the more people learn about the wonderful life of Fred Dibner. So that's the reality of the whole thing. We'll find out more about Fred Dibner. Well, we will be back next week, Chair. What a no, very... you're wrong, Tom. You're wrong. You're incorrect. You're incorrect. We won't be not back next week. We'll be back on Thursday with a bonus uh, episode. Yeah. Don't forget about that. Jesus oh, Christ. I didn't even We've got mention... content coming out of the list. I didn't even mention the Jesus Christ. Yes. Well, bonus episode out on Thursday with another guest telling us about their worst gig ever. But next Monday, we'll be back with a very, very different episode to the one you just listened to. But also out of the minds of Tom and Jerry. So... Sit back and relax and enjoy the rest yeah. of the week, boys and girls. Absolutely. Find out who the bonus guest episode is on our socials. That's why you follow them. We'll be dropping word as to who that is on Wednesday. You can listen to it on Thursday if you're subscribed. And we'll also be giving you a couple of hints as to what the uh, theme of next week's episode is. But it is another fucking cracker and I can't wait to dive into it. Absolutely. Right. To Fred Dibner, the steeplejack artist in the sky. Give me, a, give, me, give me the line. Give me, give me, the, give me the line one more time, Tom. You know, after you with the Undertaker, you know, like. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Take care, buddy. Good luck. Mm-hmm.